Find your herd, right? How many of you found your herd yet? Everybody needs to find their herd because the lions are out there. That was a great, great, great ad. Let's welcome everybody in the South Campus. Amen. Glad we're all together. One, camp, one church, two locations. Glad to have you guys with us. You know, I hope and pray this 21 days has been, a, this 21 days of prayer, which ended Saturday, uh, has been good for you. How many of you have felt like it's been good for you? Amen. Even though, you know, there's some fasting, the fasting of media, TV, fasting of food, certain kinds of food, all kinds of food. So, uh, you know, that's nobody like that part of us is, is a challenge. Amen. But how many of you have heard God during this 21 days? Let me just see your hands. South Campus, raise your hands. And how many of you have heard God tell you a next step? Because a lot of times, he, sometimes he tells you other things, but if you really, sometimes if you just need to ask him, Lord, what is the next step? Or what are you saying? You know, Jesus said in John 14, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he will show you things to come. God will get you ready for your future. And, and part of being ready is, is timely next steps. And so we've prayed as a, as a staff um, about next steps. And, and I want to share with you the next step that we're taking as a church. And the only way I know how to describe this so that you understand it as clearly as possible is a change in some job descriptions that will be happening here. And, and it will be a lead change. So I will be, I have been the senior pastor here for 30 years, and I will become the executive pastor and I'll also become the director of outreach. And I'll explain a little bit what that means. And Pastor Stephen, who has been an executive pastor, will become the lead pastor. That is the change and direct, the change, we're, it's, it's called a lead change. So, so that's what we felt like God has shown us to do. Um, this is something we've been praying about for two years two years, and, I, and what I really pray, and I, so I'm, I'm going to be a little more married to my notes than normal so that I get this right. If I don't, I'm going to talk way longer than I need to, so, and, and I have a teaching at the end, too, that I can't wait to share with you, a brief teaching, but two years ago, the Lord put it on my heart that we need a lead change to a, the next generation leader, the next generation of leadership. I'm not tired. I'm energized. I love what I'm doing. I'm not burnt out not mad at anybody. As far as I know, no one's mad at me, you know. Uh, if they are, they've hit it from me very well. So, you know, bliss, blissful ignorance is nothing like that. But what it is, is I felt like as we, as we have been, every step we've taken is how do we go forward as a church? How do we reach more people? You know, our church, our church is healthy. By all indicators, it is healthy. But this is not about just us. This is about the people we're here to reach. And I believe that the biggest harvest in this area is the uh, young adult population, the young couples. Now, that doesn't mean that's all we care about. You know, we, we're a church for all ages, all classes of people. We always have been. We always will be. But the largest group of unchurched people in East Texas is that group. They're still in that decision-making mode of life. And although I do believe I know how to connect to them, I do believe Pastor Stephen will do it better. And he is in the very stage of life they're in, in the sense that he's raised, they're raising their kids. I've raised my kids. So I can tell you how we did it, but I'm not dealing with the cultural issues that they're dealing with. And so through all those reasons, and just because I believe the Lord showed it to me, this, that's why we're making this change now. In a relay race, you know, the best in, in enduring organizations, leadership is a relay race. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a relay race, but we all know what a relay race is. And in an enduring organization, whether you raced 5, 10, 20, 30 years, whatever, all leadership is a relay. It needs to outlast the current leadership. And the best time to hand the baton off is when you're, you have to be in full stride. So, you know, a lot of organizations, they wait till things are not in full stride. They wait till there's a momentum loss. And churches have done it too, you know, like, it's really bad. We got to do something, you know. <laughs> and that's not what's happening. Praise God for that. You know, we're, we, I, I can tell you, you can ask any of our staff, any of our elders, we're healthy. You know, you can tell, you're here. 
And, and so we felt like that now was the time to do that. I want to explain to you why we're doing it. I want to explain to you why it's Pastor Stephen. And so I will uh, probably embarrass him a little bit. And I believe the role of parents is to regularly embarrass their kids. So I'm going to enjoy this, you know. Um, pastor Stephen's been our executive pastor for about six years. He came here as a media, our media pastor. And he never really, he was one of those guys that said, uh, I'm not coming back to East Texas, you know, you know, one of those, you know, get out, went to Houston, got Houston out of his system, and the Lord told him to come back here and uh, serve us, and he was a very gifted media guy, and, and I was so blessed and honored because we needed help, <laughs> and then to marry beautiful Tandra, and so I was glad for that because I was afraid some Yazoo would take her and lead her away from here. <laughs> it was a real deal. She's like a daughter to me, so I was thrilled for that. And uh, thank you, Jesus. I'm sure he did that just for me, probably. So, <laughs> but then about six years ago, we had uh, an executive pastor, very, very skilled man, but he really felt that Stephen was our next guy, and he felt his time was over. He's in Dallas now. And, and all the elders said, it's Stephen. And I, I like, you know, I was like, um, okay. You know, that was, that's going to be your call, guys, because he's my son. And um, everybody felt it was. He was already carrying the burden of this church, you know, in a proper way, not in an improper way, overstepping his bounds, you know, but just reaching out. How can we be better? And I don't know if you know this, but our church would not be, not anywhere close would not be what it is today without Pastor Stephen. He has already put his hand on so many things, so many areas, so many things I didn't see. I, you know, like our facilities, he would kind of, I really think we need to do that. And I thought, really? That's kind of, we need all those lights, really? And, and then he would do it, and I would go, man, thank God. Glad I thought of that. You know, I'm just joking. <laughs> And he's a strange mix of vision and frugality. And it's a constant tension because he's always like, doesn't want to spend the money, but wants to take us to the next level. So that's his world. If you know Pastor Stephen, that's his world. This 21 days of prayer has been his baby for the last two years. The way we do our life groups, the emphasis we have on our life groups, that's been him. All these things, a lot of the progress that we've already seen as a church have been through Pastor Stephen. So the elders felt he was to be our next executive pastor. We have a bunch of outside, we have a bunch, but a, a number of outside advisors who felt for a while that he was our guy for the next season of our church's life. And, and so I've, just to be honest, I have weighed it very carefully and said, you know, um, I want to make sure this is God because he is my son. I, and, and I don't want it to be like because he's my son, but I have looked for years. In fact, I came here th over 30 years ago from Dallas, and I have looked during that time, who is that guy? And I've had several candidates, but I can tell you none of them, none of them have even come close to Pastor Stephen. The humility, the servant heart, the work ethic, the excellence, the consistency, the faithfulness, as you've seen his teaching ability, uh, you've seen it, you've been fed by him. You know, I had a guy come up to me once, and he goes, that Pastor Stephen, he's, he's a good teacher. And then he realized I was the lead guy and goes, and, and you're good too, you're good too. <laughs> like he's, he's throwing me a bone, you know, I appreciate that, you know. I, I have, you know, I've poured into a lot of leaders over the years, and, and some have really taken hold of what I've tried to share. I've really been a father to a number of people not just my own physical son, and some have not, to be honest with you, taken what I've tried to offer them. And what happened was the orphan spirit, I began to realize there was something called an orphan spirit. And an orphan spirit doesn't trust leaders because of their past. An orphan spirit will trust peers more than leaders. I've taught on this. I've taught on this overseas. You'll probably hear me teach on it more. And, uh, and, and so when I asked the Lord, why is it my son? Why is it my physical son? You know, I don't want to be those guys that people look at, well, you know, it's because he's your son. That's not fair to him. And it's not really the story. It's not what's happening here. And the Lord showed me, I believe when I asked him about it, he showed me the relationship between the father and the son. 
and the, the amount of unity and trust and humility that exists in that relationship. And I believe that's what's been modeled and will continue to be modeled here. So just like we would not put a person in position because they're related to you, we, sent, we at the same time do not fail to put a person in position that God has raised up because they're related to you. That's, we don't want to miss God. And I believe Stephen has modeled this spirit of humility better, honestly, better than anybody I've seen. A lot of times you see somebody that's, that's humble and that's great, but sometimes you go, well, because they don't have much, to, they're just not very gifted, you know. So I mean, I'm very humble when it comes to music <laughs> for good reason. You know what I'm saying? But we need to be careful because with Pastor Stephen, we need to not let the humility that he walks in mask his strength or fool us and the brilliance and the strength that we who work with him every day have seen over the years. So I am personally thrilled that God loves us enough to give us such a a godly man and a dynamic couple because we get Tandra too, of course. And... uh, and so uh, these guys could serve in many places and could serve in much larger churches than in our church. Make no mistake about it. So, so, you know, people tell me all the time, they say, well, you know, what a great father he had and, and all of that. But I want to say it doesn't matter how great a father you have if you're not a great son. This is what I've learned in the last three years. All my life, I've fathered people, men and women. But you still have to be a great son or a great daughter. And this is the teaching we need to share with our generation. A lot of people go, well, I didn't have a good father. And then God gives them fathers, but they won't receive them. And you can't always say if somebody's messing up, it's because they didn't have a good father or or mother. So you have to be a great son. And that's when you're absent the orphan spirit. And what I'm thrilled about is that we have a current leadership team, including Pastor Stephen, who models that and our and our our society, our society desperately needs it. He represents the next generation of leadership that uh, will build on, not start over, build on the accomplishments of our generation. Isn't that what we need? Amen. I was 35 when I came here from Dallas, and he is 36, and he is in some ways, and don't tell him I said this, but more mature (laughs) than I was when I was that age, (laughs) for real, (laughs) very mature young man, and I'm I'm just, I'm honored to be his dad. So what's going to happen to me? Okay, I'm not going to Florida to play golf, God help us. I'm not going anywhere, all right? I'm not going anywhere. You're stuck with me, you know, and I will, thank you. I'm going to keep saying something until I get a, a clap, you know, so you, 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 you figured that out, right? So uh, I will continue to preach here a lot. Actually, what's happened here is that I've preached about 55%. He's preached about 45% in the last two years. And we'll just basically switch, we think, about those roles. So I'll be up here a lot. I'll be here to harass you, to disturb your life quite regularly. So, uh, so that's going to continue to happen. Uh, leadership, I will have executive responsibilities. I will take a lot of the responsibilities off him. He will continue with some executive responsibilities. I will pick up a large part of those, at least in the next season of our church's life. And... Um, Leadership here is a team sport. We do believe in team. We practice team. We have an elder team. We never go forward. Whoever is the lead person, we don't do anything of consequence without unanimous consent. That's just what we are committed to, just so you know. And so that will continue, all right? It's a team sport. There's just going to be a shift that looks small right now. It's not as big as you might think. But three years from now, it will be big. Five years from now, it will be big. Ten years from now, it'll be big. It's like a small course correction on a, on a, on a, on a jet or a, or a rocket ship or a plane. And then it doesn't look like much now, but down the road, we're going to have, a. I believe, can I just be honest with you, much more altitude than we have right now. I think we're just getting started, if I can be honest, with where we're going as a church. And I'm pretty excited about it. Um, 
I will still, if you know, you, I have a relationship with many of you. That is not going away. I will con- continue to connect with you. I'll continue to be here. Uh, maybe even more available. Who knows? We'll see how it works out. We've got a lot of work in front of us. Um, someone came to me and they said, it, we have a Paul and a Timothy. Isn't that great? So usually it's Paul then Timothy. But we now we have a Paul and Timothy. So we have a Timothy, but we still got old Paul walking around, you know. <laughs> I will add to my responsibilities and this is where I believe the Lord's put in my heart. Uh, to give us, a church, our church, a greater footprint in our community, in missions, in evangelism. In missions, uh, I, uh, in some ways, there, that has been a bit neglected. I have done a lot in the past in missions. I've taught all over the world, taught lots of leadership stuff. I have co- guys I connect with. There are pastors out there who I coach. And one of our outside advisors believe that's going to ramp up. I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't know. We'll see what happens. The, I'm not fond of flying, traveling. Uh, I have no desire to go anywhere, uh, but I will be traveling some and connect with some of our key missions people out there. In fact, uh, we will be in Israel in a couple of weeks from now, three weeks from now, with our missionaries, Greg and Sarah, to just connect with them. We'll connect with guys we support in London on the way over. And then we'll also be scouting out a possible tour in 2020, uh, we want to, we'd like to take a tour to Israel. How many of you like to go to Israel? Come on, we're, we're looking to put it together. On, we're going to take a Holy Land tour. We want to kind of go over there now and research that and map that out and craft that. And we have people on the ground that can make it very, very special. So I'm going to go over there. We're going to go over there. You'll see me blasting from Facebook. Hey, I'm at the Wailing Wall, you know. But, but then I'll come back and I'll, we'll plan it out and I'll be announcing that soon. I'm very excited about evangelism. Uh, I'm gonna, I want to put some tools together for our church to help you evangelize better. I will be preaching on evangelism this spring. We will be doing evangelistic series. We want to see, I believe we're going to see a lot more people get saved. And I'm really excited about that. And so that will be one of my main burdens is to how do we do that better as a church? How do we reach people that are really lost? You know how many know there are some really lost people in East Texas? They really are. And, and I, know, I know you don't think that. I wanted to go, I wanted to, last week I shared with you, I wanted to leave the Bible Belt. After I got saved, I've been trying to leave the Bible Belt because I got tired of all these backslidden Bible Belt people. But then the Lord reminded me, he said, he said, well, you were in the Bible Belt, and I was just lost as a goose. I mean, I, it didn't matter. I could have been in New Guinea. I was not any more, the New Guinea guy that never heard the gospel was not any more lost than I was, a kid growing up in the Bible Belt. Guys, we got tons of those kinds of people and let's pray together. How do we reach them better? Many of you, that's your story too. No matter what your history with God, God can use you to influence lost people. And I want to, I can't wait to share some of that. I have to hold back right now. So let me just say a couple things that I want to make sure you really get. Okay, here's the first one. Um, Pastor Chuck is not going anywhere. So I want everybody to look at somebody and say it like you mean. It says, Pastor Chuck is not going anywhere. Sometimes you get transition. You think, okay, this guy's leaving. This guy's not leaving. I, we own burial plots here. <laughs> we own burial plots here, okay? When I came here, I didn't want to come here from Dallas. I never want to leave. I'm, I'm for real. If God tells me, I'll obey God. I'll do what he tells me to do. But, but this, we love it here. This is our home. I've never been more motivated than I am right now to reach and, and bless our city, bless our community, bless East Texas. That's why we're starting all these outreaches. So we want to do this. So we want to, I want to lay hands on Pastor Stephen, and this is a real deal. And I really hate, I really, I really hate we're in two locations on this particular issue because I know everybody live wants to be here. And I looked for a live way to do this, and I just couldn't come up with it. And this is how we do church now, so I believe God's going to honor that. But I, wanna, I want Pastor Stephen to come up, and I want to lay hands upon him. And this is not symbolic. This is real. I'll do something symbolic in a minute, but this is real for the Holy Spirit to put upon him the anointing he needs for this lead change. Amen, Pastor Stephen. Amen. No, I want you to kneel down in front of me. 
Don't share, Neil. <laughs> Let's pray. I want everybody to stretch your hands on both campuses, please. Holy Spirit, we thank you. In the name of Jesus, I pray for the Holy Spirit to anoint Pastor Stephen at a new level a vision, of understanding, of confidence, of authority. I speak your anointing upon him. Let the Holy Spirit stir up every gift of exhortation, of teaching, of pastoring, of evangelism, of leadership. I thank you, Lord, for what we've already seen and has been amply demonstrated in our sight. And now, Lord, we thank you for the what's coming for our church and for our city, for our generation. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. All right, my man. Love this guy. Woo! Come on. Amen. That's the way it ought to be right there. Y'all are going to make me cry. I said I was not going to cry today. Yeah, right. So you're not really right. helping there. Uh, I want to say a few things real quick. And uh, first, I'm very honored and humbled uh, by the words of our pastor and my father. Um, he sees in me what I don't see in me, so I'm very grateful for that. But... um. If many of you many of you know me, you've heard my story some, you know this was not my plan. <laughs> I had to plan to own several businesses and uh, be super successful, and I owned several businesses and none of them were successful. So uh, the Lord has a way of doing things like that. But I um, was not, like he said, coming to work for the church. I didn't want to come work for the church, not because I don't love the church. Uh, I didn't want to be a pastor, not because I don't love being a pastor, but this just wasn't my plan. But a part of that is, is because when I was a kid, I was prophesied over that I would follow in my dad's footsteps. And that scared me. I was like, gosh, there's no way I can measure up to him. I'm like, I'll, yeah. I'll be compared to him. If I go back, I'll, and I'll never be able to measure up to that. And so I tried to go do my own thing and that didn't work out so well. And the Lord called me back here. And, uh, around the time we were called to be the executive pastors here, we had felt transition in our hearts, Tandra and I did. And as we prayed over it, we thought it was going somewhere. So, like, we were looking at Dallas, and we had a job in Oklahoma City we were looking at, and the Lord spared us uh, from going out of Texas. Yes, amen. But during that time when we were praying, um, the elders came to me, like he said, and said, hey, we think this is your next step. And we were, well, that's out of the blue. So we went and prayed about it, and we just felt incredible peace. And uh, just God put an overwhelming desire in my heart for you guys. I love you so much. And uh, it's been the joy and the privilege of my life to serve you, and it's exciting yeah. to be able to serve you to a greater degree now. Uh, but I want to say this as well. Um, I want to honor Pastor Chuck for all that he's done. I've watched him for 30 years uh, lead this church, lead people, um, shepherd people, care for people, go after people, and, and do it with a grace for people that many times nobody thought that they deserved, but Pastor Chuck gave them mm -hmm. that, and... I've just watched him do that and model, really, uh, a leadership style that all of us should embrace and, and model a godly character that uh, we could be like. And, and that's what you want, not only in a pastor, but a person. And he has just been a perfect example of, a, of God's heart for his people. And so can we honor him yeah. one more time? Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Now, I, I know he wants to preach still, and he's going to keep uh, preaching. Yeah, I know he wants to preach today is what I meant. He's, make him think he's ready somewhere. to preach a little bit. Uh, so um, I'm going to let him preach. Well, he's going to preach anyway. But <laughs> yeah. I'm thankful he's not going anywhere, and I know you guys are as well. Yeah, we're we're blessed to have him here with us. All right, so. we, have a, we do have a symbolic thing, and, and I'm going to ask my wife to do this. She bring it to me. Okay, this is, uh, this is a baton. And this is, uh, for, uh, it's a symbol of what's happening. And, and uh, when we first started praying about this, we read a book called Passing the Baton. And, and we, we listened to the guy who 
did that in his church. And so I'm giving this to Pastor Stephen today because someday he will give this to somebody else. Many years from now, probably 30 years, I'm sure, at least. <laughs> so, uh, so Pastor Stephen, I want to, uh, let me come over here. So I want to, it's my privilege to give you this baton that for you to carry for however long God calls you to do it. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. God bless. All right, I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles. I will teach you the Word of God, and I will talk to you about your next step. Psalms 92. Yay! Psalms 92. Have you ever felt like you're, you're having way too much fun? So you must be doing something wrong, you know? So in Psalms 92, this is something that we share in Discover New Covenant, but I want to share it today with you. Psalms 92, 12 through 14, it says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing. Say that fast five times, fresh and flourishing. The word fresh is interesting. The old King James says fat. In the old days, fat was good. It meant you were prospering. It meant life was good. You had more than enough to eat. Amen. <laughs> and that's, and, and spiritually, can I say God wants us to be that way? Amen. To feel like we have more than enough. Amen. To feel like we're not just surviving spiritually or emotionally, and I believe even financially. Right. To bless us. He's a God of blessing. And the, God, the Bible talks about, there's a key, not, this is not the only thing, but it's a big thing. And that is to be planted in the house of the Lord. So I want to just briefly mention that to you. What does it mean to be planted in the house of the Lord? It means to put your roots down. In a storm, you're as strong as your root system. When, years ago, I was in, doing a prayer retreat in Colorado and driving back across this desolate backside of the moon state called New Mexico. <laughs> I was fascinated by this plant called tumbleweeds. And a tumbleweed is the opposite of a tree that's planted. It, it, has, it has no root system. It's easily blown about. I think, I think we, have, we have a visual on that maybe, a tumbleweed. So it has no roots. It's just blown. It's dry. It's, it's, it's just surviving. And it's just a lot of people feel like this is the ultimate for them. Nothing tying you down, just do what you want, when you want, go where the wind blows. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible talks about being planted. And I'm just, just quickly, how do I put my roots down? There's, first thing is this, how do, I get, how do I put my roots down? In the church, because it says the house of the Lord. First, you have to join. Years ago, I didn't think, well, I didn't think you were supposed to join a church. And then the Lord showed me this scripture and other scriptures. The Bible teaches to be not just attend, but join. And I want to urge you, exhort you, if you have been attending and haven't joined, prayerfully consider joining. Because you need to, that's part of putting your roots down. Uh, we, ev the way we do that is every first Sunday, Discover New Covenant. You may have recognized that in our, our announcements today. So at every first Sunday at each campus at the 11.15 hour, come. And hear what it means. There's not, it's not a high-pressure thing. It's not a sales pitch. It's a vision statement about what does it mean to be a functioning, healthy member of a local church. There is a difference in your spiritual life that will happen 11-15 next Sunday. If you are at this stage of life where you've been maybe attending or checking us out, you can come indefinitely, but, but you're, there's some point your health, your spiritual growth will be stunted until you take that next step and join. The second thing is after, to get planted, first is joining, but that's not the only thing. Then you, then you need to uh, 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 attend, <laughs> you know. There are people who attend and don't join, and there's people who join and don't attend. <laughs> and, and you can't get any benefit out of it. I have, uh, I have joined Anytime Fitness. <laughs> this is my proof of membership. It has not done me any good in the last two months. <laughs> well, 
what's the use? I'm not getting anything out of that church. When's the last time you've been? I don't know. <laughs> so come, attend regularly. Put it on your calendar. Just This is where Christians are, man. Uh, we're in church. We're in church. We don't, we don't, have you noticed we don't church you to death? You know, four times a year we have these two-week revivals and you just wear yourself out coming. We have Sunday morning. That's it. Once in a great while we'll do something special. But Sunday morning and then we have small groups. So come, attend, worship when you come. Worship when you come. Try to be here on time and worship. Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out because notice what he says. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish where? In the courts of our God. How many of you know you need this regular infusion of God's presence? We need it. And I can get God's presence at home, but not at this level. That, you know, I mean, that, that's like a battery at home. This is like plugging it in, 120, 240. So we need to come, and when we come, mentally and emotionally and spiritually, physically, begin to worship. Focus on that. And then when the word comes, you're going to get fed. You're going to flourish. God's going to speak to you. Uh, connect, the third thing. So come, join, attend. That's how you get planted. And then connect. So connect is, is relationships. Colossians 2, uh, 19 tells us that all of the body, the church, is nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments and then it grows with an increase that is from God. How many know God has everything you need? I, I am constantly motivated by that fact. This God has everything I need, always and ever. And his disposition is toward me. It means he's willing to give it to me. So it's all about how do I get it. And you come, you join, you worship. That's how you get it. Obviously, you read and pray on your own. But then you build these connections. And that's what Life Groups is about. How many have ever... Uh, um, had joint problems or maybe you've torn a ligament. Anybody? I'm just curious. I tore an ACL once skiing and it was like snap and I had no knee. I mean, I really didn't. I stood up on the slope and I had no knee and I had to sit back down and wait for the snowmobile ride of shame to take me down the hill. <laughs> for real. And while I'm there, little six-year-olds are just zooming by me, you know, eight-year-olds just... And, and when, you're, when your ligament is broken and torn, you can't function. And some of you, can I just say this is your next step? You've been trying too hard too long on your own. You've maybe you're, you're working through an old mentality of what Christianity is, an outdated, not biblical idea of, of just come to church. And some people don't like a church just like ours because they're large and they're scattered in two locations. And it's like... It's impersonal. Well, of course it's impersonal. It's too many to be personal. And if you have to have a church where you know everybody, you're not, you're not going to be in a church very big. And that church is not going to be able to do a lot as a result. So we, can know, we don't know everybody, but we know somebody. And somebody knows us. And that's our team. And our ligament. And our joints. We have healthy joints. That's a vertical Worship's horizontal, joints are vertical. Does this make sense? And so that's the third thing, get connected. And here's the final thing, serve. Serve somewhere, give out. Because once life starts coming in you, then you have to give out. Uh, find a place to serve. Why don't, how many of you know this sounds great? How many of you buy into everything I'm saying so far? Okay, so why don't more people do this? Can I just suggest to you why it's uncomfortable? Initially, it's uncomfortable. It makes us move out of what we call our comfort zone. Um, if I join, my name's on the list. Now they're going to call me if I don't come. If I serve, I got to be spiritual that day. If I lead something, I have to have some kind of anointing on my life or grace if I'm leading a team somewhere like a life group or a serve team. How many know you got to be fairly spiritual even to teach in children's ministry? You got to have a little game going here or something, you know. The kids can see right through that. (laughs) 
It's uncomfortable. But it's also uncomfortable to look back on your life and there's no roots. There's no root system. There's no team. There's no fruit. It says they'll be fruitful in the old age if you get planted. But if you don't get planted, you're probably not going to be fruitful. And you, you know, and I know some people have an independent spirit. I don't need to join a church to be a Christian. You and I can have a conversation about that. And I will show you where you're wrong. That's not New Testament Christianity. And that's what we are absolutely passionate about around here. New Testament Christianity. So, what is your next step? What is God telling you to do? Many of you, the four things I just mentioned, you identified your next step. Here's what I believe as I prayed about this. Obedience. What does it mean to obey God? Here's what I think it means. Obedience to God means you usually voluntarily put yourself in a challenging situation. If God, if it's not challenging, can I just suggest to you it's not God? It's you. If it's something you can do by yourself without his help, it's yet not him. Because when God tells you to do something, it's challenging. You got to pray about it. You got to walk with him. You got to use your faith. It's it's inconvenient sometimes and I don't mean put yourself where you're overly stressed and you can't fulfill your other responsibilities I understand we're very busy people but I promise you every single one of us God has a calling on us and a cha- and a, an obedient step and if we'll do it we'll grow and we'll bear fruit this is not comfortable for Pastor Stephen it's not real comfortable for me because this is all I've done for 30 years and I will still be doing it alongside the team but it's a Slightly different lead change. So it's something I've had to obey God in. But, but there's a part of me that's excited because I love doing what God's up to, man. It's just, how do you know, it's just, it's just cool to do what God's doing. And, 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 and whatever God's doing, there's an element of the unknown that's always there. It keeps you on your game. It keeps you on your edge. It keeps you from deteriorating. When we're not challenged, how many of you know we just deteriorate? We just flat out deteriorate. If we can do it in the flesh, we live in the flesh. But if what God tells you to do requires you to not live in the flesh, then that's to your advantage. Well, you've got to be there. You've got to pray. You've got to show up. You've got to hear God. You've got to have faith. There's a part of you that's a little nervous about it. Then you're you're probably smack dab in the middle of God's will at that point. So I want to leave you with this challenge of what is your next step we wanted to just talk about this at the end of our 21 days here we are I think it's been a great season for us some of you it's it's you need to start witnessing more you need to start sharing your faith you need to start caring about the people you work around that are lost and on their way to hell for real and you've got to come out of your obscurity and begin to talk to them about Jesus and try to get them to come to a life-giving church How many of you at the end of this 21 days can say, Pastor, and even today, maybe in the message, I feel God has shown me what my next step is. How many of you say, let me see your hand. I'm not going to ask you what it is between you and God, but how many of you say, I think I know what my next step is. Me and God. What is that? What is that stretch goal? What is that thing that makes you step out of your comfort zone? How many, look, hold it up one more time. I'm not going to, we don't have photos. We're not taking your picture. All right, if you, if you say whether I know it or not, and most of you know it, some of you I'm going to ask you to keep praying about what that is till you know it. You say, Pastor, as we head into the new year, I want to take my next step. I want you to stand on both campuses, and I want to pray for you. Whatever that is, I want to take my next step. Whatever it is, God. Because he probably is not going to tell you till you say whatever it is, I'll do it. We don't get to say, show me, and I'll tell you if I'll do it. Have y'all figured that out about God? If God would just show me his will, then I'll say, yes, I'll do it. No, 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 that's, you got it backward. It's whatever your will is, I'll do it. Then he shows it to you. So how many of you by standing are saying, that's what I'm saying before the Lord today. Whatever it is, God, I'll, whatever it is, I'll do it. Let's, say, let's tell that to the Lord together on both campuses. Lord, we are saying to you, as your people, redeemed by your hand, by washed, redeemed by the blood of Jesus, bought with the price. We are not our own God. 
We are not our own. We are saying we'll do it, Lord. We'll do it. Here am I. Here am I, God. Whatever you tell me to do, I will do it. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Woo! Come on. God is good. Amen. Praise you, God. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, our team is coming, and they're here, available. And uh, we love you guys. And uh, if you need prayer for any reason, please give us the privilege and the joy of praying with you. And I can't wait. How many know I can't wait for 2019? How many say I can't wait for We're here. I can't wait for the future. Let's, let's go. Let's all run into it. God bless you.